I'm Rob LaCuria, Senior Editor at Gold Derby, here with John Hurwitz, Josh Heald, Hayden Schlossberg, creators and showrunners of the Netflix blockbuster Cobra Kai. Firstly, guys, I, I know this was a while ago, but I just want to say congratulations on your show being nominated at the Emmys for Best Comedy Series. That is not an easy thing to achieve these days. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks so much. We were thrilled. So, yeah, take me back to that moment when it happened and you were uh, included in some really amazing company and forever you'll be known now as, you know, the Emmy-nominated creators and producers of an Emmy-nominated show. We were just shocked that it didn't happen season one. So exactly. for us, we're like, it's a long time coming. Uh, <laughs> no, but we were, you know, the, the truth of the matter is, you know, uh, the show has had a long journey. Uh, we've been proud of the work that we've been doing since the beginning. We thought that, you know, taking the, this character from from the past who was a villain and making him a sympathetic uh, uh, lead who at times you're watching the show and you're emotionally invested in his story deeply to the point of tears. You, you watch him cry and you cry. And to be honest, we think that's hilarious. <laughs> you know, the fact that we took, uh, you know, that this character that we all hated when we were young and now the world is able to watch him and, uh, and be along for his journey. We buy into the drama. We're emotionally connected to the drama of it as well. But, you know, this has been a show that uh, we thought was a, a funny concept and, and is a weird blend of com comedy and drama and action and all these different things. And when we did get that nomination, the three of us were thrilled. It was it's one of those things. There's a lot of hard work that goes into the show, not just us, but our entire team from writing to the actors, to music, to post, to everybody involved in this process that uh, it was just a big victory for a group of people that we all love working with. Yeah, I, um, you know, this show is funny. It's, it can be quite outrageous. It's lighthearted, but there's some really earnest, sincere, and ultimately really deep material, particularly that you mine for season four. Like you really, you really surprised me. I didn't think we were going to get so much development in terms of particularly Johnny, as you mentioned, I hated that guy when I was growing up. And I just think William Zucker does such a beautiful job of that character. I felt like there were three really important narrative arcs throughout the season. And I was, I was trying to boil it down. And I think um, the first one is that, you know, that acceptance of each other's differences and being stronger together you know, who's right? Is it Johnny who wants to fight and strike back or is it Daniel who wants to be diplomatic and sit back and diffuse? So I love that. Um, did you think, um, guys, that this was an important thing to, to establish for the two main characters, how they're together, then they're apart, and then, of course, at the end, they, they realise they have to be back together. It's the only way forward. We look at our seasons as each season of our show is kind of two seasons in one. You know, our, our midpoint is its own journey to get there. And if you look at every season of Cobra Kai, it's the same thing. You know, in season one, it was Miguel going from zero to defeating his bully. That's the first half of that season. And then where do you go from there? And we try to do that every season to upend the speculation in terms of where is the season going to go? There's enough cliffhanger storylines and headspace that the audience can infer where we might be going for a portion of the storylines or a portion of the season. And for going into season four, the big question is now that these guys had bowed to each other and seemingly had gotten to a place of being ready to bury the hatchet, um, what is that relationship going to be like? And we wanted to evolve it and devolve it over the course of those uh, five episodes. Uh, but we also need wartime um, you know, compatriots and you need to find uh, the en enemy of your enemy is your friend. And sometimes, uh, sometimes it's more than that. And sometimes it's really you know, both of these guys learning to actually put aside some of their hangups and actually look each other in the eye and, and saying some of the things that it does take a whole season to say. There's the moment of let's do this because we're feeling the adrenaline. And then there's the moment of let's break up because it's not going so easy. And then there's the moment of let's acknowledge or at least begin to acknowledge some of what's going on with us. And we wanted to explore that and, and every aspect of that over that season. Yeah, it's that yin and yang of the two of them together that um, 
they come to blows and then they're back because they know they are stronger together. The other, one of the other through narratives that I really, really responded to was the importance of father figures or lack thereof in our lives. We can all tap into that in some way. Um, you know, Johnny and Miguel have absent fathers. Johnny and Miguel have that heart to heart where, you know, Johnny's really drunk and um, there are real tears in that one. I, I couldn't believe the beautiful performances that they both brought to that scene. So emotionally intelligent. And then, of course, Johnny and Robbie at the end, the payoff that we've been waiting for. Who would like to talk to that through? Because you see it a lot even with, um, you know, with Daniel and his his kid. You know, you know, Griffin Santo Pietro all of a sudden is a man now. I don't know how that happened. But like, there's a lot going on with father figures in this one, and that really hits for a lot of us. Absolutely. You know, we love the original Karate Kid and the... Um, relationship between Mr. Miyagi and Daniel is is the central one in that and every season of Cobra Kai while we try to take things up a notch and bring it into, you know to the next level in a lot of ways we also try to stay true to the roots of what we love about this franchise and that relationship between mentor and student father figure and you know um and son or daughter, you know, we we played that, you know, in a variety of different ways and relationships. That's the benefit of having a series is you could, you know, you could explore all the different types of relationships. And, you know, we have some father figures, like, you know, John Kreese is the father figure to, to Johnny Lawrence. And, you know, he wants this guy out of his life. He blames his whole life, you know, because of, uh, you know, Chris led him down a wrong path. And so he wants to be the, the different kind of father figure to this next generation. And, you know, in the process, you know, it's, it's difficult uh, when you have a biological son and a, you know, a surrogate son who both hate each other. Um, you know, it's, there's, there's the soap opera of it all, which we try to, you know, keep as real as possible so that like you do have these emotional moments that are not just sappy, but that you're that are tearing your heart out. And then, you know, as as John said, you know, this is the the karate kids bully from the original movie. So whenever we get if we can bring it to these like really heartfelt places, it's you know, it's amazing for us because we know that, you know, you know, Johnny Lawrence is our Walter White or our Tony Soprano, who this anti-hero that we're taking through this journey. And um, and so, yeah, we, we I don't know, it, it's just something that at, on the one hand feels very Karate Kid to us, the father-son relationship and stays true to the franchise, but it also, you know, we find new ways to get those emotions out and get the audience invested in this main character through that, that type of relationship. Yeah, and you're constantly reinventing the um, the way in which we ta we tackle this uh, um, this theme with through new characters and new dynamics. It, it's constantly shifting. The cast is so massive now. Um, the show has always relied on nostalgia to some extent, and that's uh, one of the things that got a lot of us fans into the show to begin with because of our love affair with the film from the '80s. But I think we've moved on from nostalgia to a, a huge extent but we're still honouring the past and also trying to let go of the past. And that's what a lot of season four was about. Johnny and Daniel, of course, um, Robbie and Kenny, you know, it's like history repeating. Um, even Tori and Mrs. LaRusso, you know, Mrs. LaRusso sees something in her that she wants to maybe get her to break that pattern. But of course it's Chris and Terry. That was the real highlight for me and many of us. What genius casting to bring him back. He's so good in this. Um, who wants to talk to bringing that dynamic onto the show? Because it just changes everything. So so the three of us have always loved Thomas Ian Griffith's performance in Karate Kid 3. Not a perfect movie. Certainly elements that go a little bit over the top. And, you know, there were storytelling challenges there. But the performance was magnetic. It was something that was very memorable. And... You know, we always talked about, okay, how are we going to bring him back? And it started with what we did in season three with the Vietnam stuff. It was we wanted to reintroduce the concept of Terry Silver and this relationship and give the depth of this backstory that you got a taste of in, in Karate Kid 3 of John Kreese back in the day had this war buddy. So we wanted to introduce this new audience who doesn't really know Karate Kid 3, this dynamic that we saw when they were kids. And then in season four, 
bring him back into the world and make sense of the insanity of Karate Kid 3 at, at, from the jump. So, you know, yeah. we like the idea of taking it where Terry has moved on, that in the wake of the events of Karate Kid 3, his life kind of spiraled out of control in certain ways and his best friend had kind of abandoned him because of the humiliation of what happened with that tournament. And they've had all these years apart. So bringing in a Terry Silver that is not that, you know, you know, complete, uh, you know, insane, hot, you know, uh, sauna scheming kind yeah. of uh, villain from Karate Kid 3, but instead make him a guy who's more evolved at the beginning of this. And what he did in the past is insane, as we all saw, you know, so he's kind of in on what we all felt. And then from there have uh, Kreese slowly bring back that character that we all loved back then, but with new context. So it's the, you see the unraveling of Terry Silver and a complexity in this relationship between these two friends that obviously leads to, uh, you know, the demise of, of John Kreese uh, in a way that I think no one would have expected. So, you know, it was, it was the three of us were thrilled to bring um, Thomas back. He was phenomenal as a man who hasn't acted in a very long time and has had a screenwriting yeah. career. Um, he's as good and as prepared of a performer as we have on the show. And I, I would um, also just, just ha having John Kreese have a peer, you know, it really yeah. adds to the generational aspect of the show because you have, you know, these ex Vietnam guys, you know, who are talking about the past, then like, you know, the, Johnny Lawrence and, uh, uh, you know, Daniel LaRusso, the, the middle-aged kind yeah. of characters yeah. going through their crisis. Then you have your teenagers. Then you have like the younger teens, like in, in middle school. Like, so it, you know, this season really felt like, you know, you're, you're it's, it's becoming like, you know, at every age, you know, the challenges that you're going through and everybody's a mentor to somebody else and is going through kind of, you uh, you know, you know, a different crisis, but in a different age group. That's right. There's so much cross collaboration and there's like original series, next generation, deep space nine, like the way that you've set up this <laughs> thing. It's like, I just love the way when I started seeing, you know, um, Anthony and of course, Kenny played by Dallas Young, I thought, okay, here we go again. It's history repeating, but you're just, you're not just following the same tropes. You, you're mixing things up. You're switching them up. And of course, you've got these young actors who are just so damn good. You've got such a great cast. Now, my favorite character is Hawk. And I'm so glad you got to really flesh out that character with Dimitri. Um, what, what, how do you feel about bringing on all these really young actors? Is it challenging to, to make sure that they're all hitting the right notes? Or are you finding that they're all just blending so beautifully together? It's, it's a real pleasure to watch a character like Griffin, you know, the, a character like Anthony, you know, played by Griffin, who's been on the show since season one and has been there, you know, in his younger days as comic relief to, to you know, to pop the balloon and to, to say something really, you know, unlikable to Johnny that gets a huge belly laugh and to kind of feel completely just anti-karate, doesn't want anything to do with it, you know, just 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 this guy who's like, yeah, dad, you you have your whole thing. I'm, I got my thing too, it's a video game. And then to dig into that and to just say, your turn and you know what what does that character go through on you know the the precipice of uh, entering high school and to you know to to bring in dallas and and to explore the idea of a kid who you know once again here's another version of a you know daniel larusso from 1984 who you know has you know a, a parent who's not home enough and seeing exactly what's going on um looking for the right mentor you know having the added you know element of um, a brother who had paid the price once before um, and building a relationship with somebody who doesn't realize he's playing with fire himself. Um, there was something really fun to explore there. And then you talk about, you know, Una O'Brien coming in, you know, as Devin um, and getting to just to, to go further and further with expanding this world and bringing in different types of voices, different types of points of view that, you know, come at karate completely differently you know for for the role of devon we love the idea that there's this this no holds barred you know debater who leaves no prisoners uh, take you know just everyone's dead on the debate field and johnny harnesses that energy and, and turns her into a, a badass at the eagle fang dojo and you start looking at all of these 
you know, these pieces of this greater puzzle and realize that, you know, this thing can really keep expanding in a way that doesn't feel like we're, we're just plagiarizing ourselves. Yeah, it's boundless. You've got, and then you've got the girls as well at the end, you know, strong young women, Sam and um, Tori, who battle it out. And that's how you ended the, the tournament with the, with the young women. That's just, you know, you're just totally mixing things up and not just for the sake of it, because we really do care about those characters. Actually, it reminds me, those last two episodes were unbelievable. Like you actually upped the ante from all the previous tournaments because there's nothing higher than the stakes for the in the valley for karate teenage karate there is just no other higher stakes right josh you your directing of those two episodes unbelievable i think that's the best directing i've seen um on a comedy series all season i hope you get nominated for, for an emmy for it Thank and of course much. um the three of you wrote the part the sorry not the part the season premiere um and then of course you hand over to other directors and other collaborators in your writer's room um, do you do that for logistics or do you do that because you want, is there another reason for why you want to bring in other voices on the show? Well, there's, it's a combination of everything. I mean, we can't, you know, you know, it's a lot of episodes to start. And then over the course of years, we've gotten to know writers that, you know, our writing staff is, you know, stayed, um, you know, pretty consistent with new additions coming in every year. And so we, we've reached a point where, you know, everybody, we have a, a whole team of people that are invested in these characters and their storylines and everybody wants to, you know, get involved and, and contribute to the being, you know, playing the fate of, of what happens to the, the, the characters. So it's um, the, the last episode though, those last two episodes are, you know, some of the most complex Incredible. structurally that we've ever dealt with. And it really, you know, um, there's a whole team of writers, you know, that are involved in trying to figure out like all these different payoffs. You know, when, when you look at the the prior tournaments, you know, obviously in the original movies, it's just Daniel LaRusso that you're invested yeah. in and everything is connected around him. Um, and in the first, um, season it was really miguel and robbie as as the main characters that you're following with with a couple supporting now by season four there are so many different storylines that you're invested in and we have to pay off so many different things and and different relationships to shoot that you know there, there's a lot of impressive things that you know josh did in terms of uh capturing you know the stunts and and interesting visuals but probably the biggest challenge is just all the interconnectivity of yeah, all the different storylines. You know, when, when it, something happens with one character on a mat, there's usually three or four characters connected to that character that either are, you, you need to get the reaction positive or negative or whatever that is. And yeah. it was, you know, to, to pay that off where you have basically like 15 Daniel LaRussos that we're following all like, you know, reaching, you know, their kind of season climax um, was, it was daunting. And I would say, you know, there's a lot of writers not credited on that also that, that, that go into, to all of this. Yeah, we, yeah, we, I, felt, I, we felt that, oh, I'm sorry. We, we, we felt that those, that tournament coming, you know, that going into yeah. that season, we knew, we're going to this tournament, you know, it's probably going to be in the last episode. Okay. You know what? We have so much story to tell Let's Let's tell it over two episodes, but that, that was the most pressure I think we've had. We put on ourselves since the beginning of the series in terms of we're going to do something on this show that we've already done. We've already had an all Valley tournament. Um, the difference now is like Hayden said, we're invested in like 40 times more storylines how do we tell those without feeling like you're just watching an endless sporting event and waiting to get to the main event? And it really does take a village. I mean, that was all season long in that writer's room. You're talking about, okay, like this is the, the building block that's going to set up what's going to happen here. And like Hayden said, the, the, the writers who aren't credited on that episode, it's everybody. It's figuring out how are the quarterfinals its own kind of vibe? How are the skills competition represented in a way that, you know, doesn't feel like we're, we're just watching an endless uh, karate demonstration. Um, you know, what, what is the, what is the headspace going into this tournament in general that makes you feel like it's a versus B versus C um, it's, it was, it was a great exercise in, in writing to get to that point. Yeah. I, I just wanted to add. So first of all, want to, also say what an amazing job Josh did wrangling those episodes and we've already gotten into that so enough about him what I want to talk more about is 
just oh, as the time has gone on uh, with the show, what's unique, season one, the three of us directed six of the 10 episodes. We wrote half the season. And because it was a new show, the scripts that were coming in, we were rewriting most of it because it was the vision that was in our head. A lot of the writers that were in, in that season one room then saw the show and got to be part of it. And as time has gone on, not only the people in that room, but people who are fans of the show, who became writers on our show or directors on our show, knew the show as well as we did at that point, in a sense, where the, 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 when you ask about like, why don't we do all the writing or all the directing anymore? The biggest thing is because we don't have to. And it's like, we love doing it and it's amazing, but it's a lot of work and we're super busy and we're juggling a lot of things, not only this project, but other projects. And we're, we have the luxury of an amazing writing staff as we've alluded to several times in the last few minutes of, of a combination of people who were there from the beginning who are phenomenal. And when they hand in scripts now, they're in the voice. They're, they're so complex, they're hilarious. Like all the things that you want from these writers or new writers who come into the room who just were fans of the show and now they're happy to be there and they're contributing uh, ideas that they have. Same thing goes on the directing side of things. It's now that the show has existed for a long time and the actors kind of know their characters or more than kind of know their characters well and the scripts are, are, are well-defined. There are directors who have watched all the episodes of the show beforehand. We don't hire people to direct our show unless they love the show. So it's, you know, we have these people come in it's this new, like almost like a youthful energy to their, uh, their, their approach to each episode because they're just super fans and they come in and they get to play in the sandbox like we do. And that's why we love the show. We still to this day pinch ourselves, but season one in particular, we're like, look, we have Daniel LaRusso and we have Johnny Lawrence and look what we're doing with them, you know? And, and that was the whole thing. And uh, it's fun to watch others on the writing side and on the directing side uh, get to have this experience that we've loved having. And it, and it enables us to edit. I mean, honestly, like in season That's one, true. we were writing and directing so much, you know, we, we really didn't start editing that season until we got out of it, which is normal for making a, a feature film, but not really for a television schedule. And now because there's so many voices and so many partners we trust, uh, we're able to actually show run at times, which doesn't have us only in, you know, the minutia of a singular episode. Yeah. And it's so seamless, um, and that's testament to the team that you've been able to bring together. Just watching Robbie and Kenny fight, and uh, Hawk actually gets to win, and the girls, and it's just there was so much going on. I, you you actually upped the ante. I don't know what on earth you've got in store for us for season five, just coming out in September. I know you're in post now. Good luck, Chosen's back. Who knows what's going to happen? Hurry up and just get it onto my screen because I'm dying to see it. And thank you. Congratulations on a really, really strong season four. Thank oh, you so much, Robert. Thank you so much.